feel free to start. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Hyun Gi Sung, one of the authors of this paper. Um, we prepared a presentation about the game theoretic model predictive control with data driven model identification for head to head racing. This is the overview of our contents. Uh, we will introduce the program statement, the overview of our system, the detailed methodologies and experiment results. Um, researches on autonomous racing have mainly focused on driving fast with no opponents on the track. Uh, so now we would like to extend the topic to head-to-head -to -head racing and investigate what more is needed. Um, first of all, for safe driving, we need to predict the future trajectory of surrounding vehicles to understand the other vehicles' intentions and strategies. Next, um, since race situations uh, change over a longer time than what a typical vehicle controller can handle, um, we need a high-level high planner that defines how the controller should behave in certain moments. And lastly, we need a vehicle controller to handle the collision avoidance with considering the uh, multiple racing strategies. Um, here is an overview of our head-to-head -head autonomous racing system. Um, in the offline phase, we identified the parameters of the nonlinear dynamic vehicle model, especially the tire model through a data-driven approach. These parameters are used in model-based algorithm of our online phase. Um, our system consists of three modules in the online phase. Um, first, an opponent future trajectory predictor, which is based on the sequential gain concept. Second, a high-level race strategy planner with respect to surrounding opponent's trajectories and ego vehicle state. And third, a nonlinear pred model predictive controller based on the above mentioned information to get control solutions. Um, at first, let me introduce the, the data-driven model identification. In high-speed racing, uh, since the nonlinearity of vehicle dynamics is dominant, accurate dynamics model identification is required for an optimized driving commands. We found our optimized model parameters from a collected data set by half-parameter optimization scheme. We defined a simplified Paseca model as the tire model and collected the, the side slip angle, steer angle, throttle, uh, velocities, and tire forces as input and label data. The model parameters can be searched by hyperband, which is one of the hyperparameter optimization algorithms. We define a root mean square error between inferred and labeled data of the tire forces as an evaluation loss and optimize the model parameter to, to the direction of minimizing the evaluation loss. Um, to overtake surrounding opponents, the ego vehicle should consider the future trajectories of the opponents. We estimate the opponent's trajectories by solving sequential MPC problems. The MPC problem, which has uh, same formulation with ego vehicles, is solved with other opponents' states and return a reasonable future trajectories. As you know, the head-to-head uh, -head racing is a multi-agent environment where end player compete with each other. Therefore, to, to tackle this end player problem, we use stack caliber sequential game concept, which is a leader follower game approach. We turn the uh, two-player sequential game into an end player problem by recursive process. At first, um, estimate the most forward opponent, and based on this uh, result, solve an optimal response of the second leading opponent. The result trajectories are recursively stacked, and finally, the ego vehicle derive the optimal control solution by considering the estimated trajectories of all proceeding opponents. Um, based on the prediction results, we roll out um, uh, different modes, position keeping and overtaking modes to compare, to compare um, which mode gives the best result. Um, each mode is tuned to the track shape, uh, which is straight or curve and uh, overtaking feasibility. Um, this division of modes gives a, a practical advantage that we can utilize our high-level intuitions separately to 
uh, to each commonly seen uh, situation. Um, every mode has to, has to balance between aggressiveness and conservativeness. Um, the driving st stability is uh, more important in the curved track, but however, um, uh, in the in the straight line, in the straight track, uh, the taking advantage of the directing effect to gain more speed is uh, more important, and which is um, critical to winning the race. Um, next, the MPC uh, controller executes uh, actions after the high-level strategy planner uh, has found the right code function, and the sequential game theoretic motion predictor has generated the uh, opponent's future trajectories, uh, which becomes the moving constraint for every time step. Um, we set the MPC constraint to account for the uncertainties by modeling each opponent's future trajectory into a series of Gaussian distribution. Um, we use its op observed position and combined uncertainty as mean and variance sigma of the distribution respectively. Um, the sources of combined, sorry, um, the sources of combined uncertainty include sensing and control law used by opponents. Um, the decision variable here is the confidence interval P on the bar T uh, that decides the, the radius of constraint circle P on the bar T times uh, sigma. And uh, these figures show the, the simulation results. Um, the figure above is a comparison of results depending on whether the high-level uh, strategy planner is used or not. Um, this scenario shows a situation in curved track when the uh, opponent has similar speed with eagle vehicle, uh, where overtaking may cause worse lap time performance. Um, the eagle vehicle on the left figure, which is a green one, try to overtake when, when it is close to the front uh, opponent and fail to overtake and lag behind the opponents because the curve track requires a much higher rel relative velocity for the ego vehicle to overtake the opponent on the right side. But however, um, by using the high level planner, uh, the ego vehicle on the right figure, which is a blue one, can choose a position keeping mode with respect to the front op front opponent. Um, the ego vehicle could keep a close distance with the opponent without any collision. The figure below uh, illustrates a head to head racing with four players. As I mentioned before, the ego vehicle sequentially estimate the future trajectories uh, from the most forward vehicles. And based on this uh, future trajectories, uh, our ego vehicle can derive a collision-free optimal uh, MPC solution. And finally, there is a video related to the uh, aforementioned experiments. Um, in the position keeping mode, the MPC controller encourages the ego vehicle to keep the racing line rather than trying to overtake. Uh, therefore, the ego vehicle can reduce unnecessary overtake trials in almost equal performance situations with the opponent and try overtaking in more uh, potential situations. The video on the right side is an example of uh, overtaking of our algorithm. Um, the speed of, speed of the simulator was slow, so we, the, the video was made at 10x speed. Um, the future trajectories of the front vehicle was estimated through the MPC problem with respect to the opponent's state, and the ego vehicle can safely overtake uh, by driving a collision-free MPC problem. Um, yeah, this is the presentation we have prepared. Uh, thank you for listening. Yeah, and thank you very much for the nice presentation. Uh, we know it's a, a spoiler alert for what we will see in a few months at the Indie Autonomous Challenge. And I'm sure Madur is getting afraid now because now he has to redevelop his algorithms. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. Um, very happy to have you here and thank you very much for submitting your paper. Uh, we would move on directly to the next presentation um, from Nan Lee. Um, and he's talking about 
autonomous race car control in head-to-head -head competition using mixed integer quadratic programming. So we will now see some optimization techniques for head-to-head -head racing. Nan Lee, it's your turn. Thank you very much for being here today. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so hello everyone. I'm very happy to be here. I'm Nan from Telecom Paris, Institute Polytechnic de Paris. So today I would like to introduce my work on autonormal risk car control. Firstly, let's define the problem. We assume that there are two vehicles, eco vehicle and the leading vehicle on the racing track for a head to head competition. Eco vehicle knows about the leading vehicle's trajectory. Meanwhile, it's eco vehicle who is responsible for avoiding potential collisions. There is an existing work uh, which proposed a special NMPC method. Uh, we, we could see that uh, it used a covilinear coordinate system in which the mass of the vehicle will have a projection point on the uh, center line. The center line is also the reference line. So we can use the uh, deviation from the reference line to represent vehicles uh, relative position and relative orientation. And along curve lengths, we could uh, discretize the states and controls as different steps in the prediction horizon. We use a classic dynamic bicycle model, just uh, as shown as uh, Alex. So uh, in this curve linear uh, uh, coordinate system, we could see that the time t is a variable dependent on the curve length s. So it's possible to set the progress time t as a direct optimization objective. As shown here, what we want to minimize is the progress time t at the last step in the prediction. Meanwhile, it should respect the constraints on the system dynamics, also on the states and the controls, especially in this work, we will show how to build up a collision avoidance constraint. There are several difficulty in, in, in the paper mentioned before is for a single vehicle uh, racing. And for us, it's a hide to hide uh, uh, racing. So it's important to approximate the vehicle's shape to ensure a complete uh, safety, a complete uh, no collision between two vehicles. And then since that we uh, discretize the ego vehicle states and controls along the curve lens, curve lens but not uh, uh, along the progress time. So somehow we need to uh, find the method to interpolate legal leading vehicle's position. So firstly, uh, we, we show here, we approximate the vehicle's shape as a circle, and then we project it in the covilinear coordinate system. It's just a simple interval site as shown in the right. We could build up the collision avoidance and finally, this four uh, constraint will be formulated as a mixed integer form. But here, we need to firstly give the information about the leading vehicle, the SLV and the EYLV. How we to interpolate the leading vehicle's position? Firstly, we will uh, estimate the corresponding time instant Ti the i means the s step in the prediction horizon. We learn, uh, we estimated this information from the last step calculation result. And then we infer the leading vehicle's position, say between the sampling point one and the point two. And finally, we could build a simple linear interpolation. We perform the simulation on these two different tracks. And we use a 1 to 43 miniature race car model. We suppose that both cars have the same dynamics and the leading vehicle 
uh, leading vehicle's optimal trajectory is pre-calculated. This is for the simplicity. In theory, it can be estimated online. We use the Akido called generation tool to generate the framework SQP. And we, uh, we have a wrapper to call for uh, MIQP solver in Guhobi. The simulation is run on a standard laptop. In this table, I showed the result on both tracks. And uh, as a baseline, we could see that this is for the single vehicle, single vehicle racing. And uh, since that the header to cat computation, computation, the ego vehicle should take into consideration the potential collision. So it get a worse lap time if we compare to the single mode. Meanwhile, if we use a short horizon, there is a risk of leading to the collision cases. If we increase the horizon length, we could see that we get a better lap time. Meanwhile, it increases a lot the calculation time. Here is a typical scenario. We could see that initially, ego vehicle is behind the leading vehicle. In the prediction horizon, it plans to right side overtake leading vehicle and then keep the advantage until at the end, the ego vehicle situated at the left of leading vehicle. I have an animation to show this scenario. Ego vehicle is behind the leading vehicle. And now right side overtaking leading vehicle. Now at left side, and finally totally uh, overtake leading vehicle. So we have seen the effectiveness of this proposed algorithm. For a short prediction horizon, it's possible to implement on a real world car or on a real robot. But for a long prediction horizon, we find that it, it, it takes too long, a little too long to calculate on board. So we are thinking about several possibilities to overtake this, uh, overcome this problem. The first one is that we observed that when the ego vehicle try to overtake leading vehicle, usually it takes successive decisions. For example, in the previous example, we see that the successive following, successive one set overtaking. So by using this fact, we could simplify the decision combinatorix. And another possibility is to applaud the structure of MIQP problem and maybe take the advantage of the hardware system. So that's all. Thank you for your listening. Yeah, and thank you very much for this nice presentation. Um, optimization techniques, uh, I think we will see a lot today. Um, yeah. um, this is one interesting approach how you solved it. Thank you very much uh, for your paper and the presentation. Thank you. Now we move on directly uh, to the next paper. Um, it's from Yung Long Song. And um, we are talking about reinforcement learning for car racing and overtaking. And first presentation today where we try to solve the autonomous racing problem just with machine learning techniques. Let's see how it worked out. Yung Long, it's your time to present. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks for the nice introduction. Let me share my screen. Do you see my presentation? Yes, we can see it and can hear it loud and clearly. Okay, thank you. So uh, my name is Yun Wong Song and I'm currently a PhD student at the Robotic and the Second Group at Biotechnology Club Mozart, the University of Zurich. And today I would like to share my work on realms learning for car racing and overtaking and this is a project joined uh, together with uh, Sony. So uh, in this project, our goal is to develop autonomous racing and overtaking system in Gran Turismo Sport. And Gran Turismo Sport is world car leading, uh, is world leading car simulator, and also a game, a video game for car racing. And it is unique platform for testing autonomous systems because it allows simulating like very high fatality race cars and also race tracks. In addition, it also allows us to compare the performance of our autonomous system directly against the professional human drivers. 
And as you can see in various uh, presentations, this uh, autonomous racing system can be solved using classical approaches. And classical approaches generally decouple the problem into sub-modules, which consists of state estimation, planning, and control. And it has achieved great success in controlling the vehicle, physical vehicle at high speed in the real world. However, it has some limitations. For example, for the planning, when if you want to achieve uh, online planning, you have to make some simplified assumption about the physical uh, vehicle dynamics. And for the control, if you use optimization-based approach, it can be computationally expensive where you can see the very high fidelity uh, dynamics. And um, in robotic research, there's different line of research which focus on end-to-end -end approach for this problem. And the main idea of the end-to-end -end approaches is to develop and is to train a neural network policy, which takes whatever observations the robot, the robot can observe and control the vehicle directly. And this observation can be very high dimensional, for example, like images or like a uh, LIDAR. And actually, uh, this kind of approach has been demonstrated back in 1991. A neural network policy trained with imitation learning can already control the uh, car autonomously and drive on the highway. And recently, due to the development of a uh, new network, it can achieve more agile uh, autonomous driving with imitation learning. And in this work, what we are focusing on is to develop an autonomous system that can drive faster than human experts. So because the goal is to, to drive faster, so we don't want to make any simplified assumption about the system dynamics. And also, we don't have the demonstration, uh, demonstration available, which can already outperform human experts. And that's why we just decided to use reinforcement learning. And the power of reinforcement learning is it can combine with neural networks. It can leverage neural networks for high dimensional space. And it does not require like the uh, demonstration or simplified assumption for the system dynamics. As you can see on the right hand side, this is like very standard reinforcement learning framework and an agent to try to solve the task by interacting with the environment without knowing the system uh, or the environment. And it maximizes the human agent rewards. And um, hence can optimize the policy, uh, can, hence can optimize the parameters of the, of the policy. And for the autonomous racing problem specifically, the goal is to minimize the time. But this time is very sparse signal. If you minimize this time directly, it, it can be very challenging because only a pump is one left, you can get one variable which matches how fast you are along this check. And instead of doing minimizing the time directly, what we do is maximize the progress along the central line projection. This has also been done in the literature. And we formulate the autonomous racing problem as kind of a cost project, a cost progress maximization problem. As you can see on the right hand side, which shows the projection of the current car position on the center line of the track. And by maximizing the progress along the center line, we can achieve a uh, very fast and agile uh, driving. And we train a multi-layer perception policy, which can map the observation directly to the control commands. And the observation for our case consists of the uh, acceleration of the vehicle, velocity, and also the distance measures to the, ed to, the edge to the edges. And for the training, we train the policy in the simulator. And we maximize the expected reward using off-policy realms learning called soft actor critical. And this, uh, this algorithm is very data efficient because it can reuse experience from reuse previous experience, which was put it into a replay, replay buffer. And you can kind of do uniform sampling from this uh, replay buffer such that we use the uh, data. And also we use parallelized uh, simulation and distrib distributed sampling. We use uh, four PlayStation and in each station we simulate 20 cars in parallel. It can speed up the uh, data collection and also reduce training time. So for the experiments, we test the performance of our policy on three different settings. So in these three different settings, we have two different uh, race cars and two different race tracks. And this, we have relative simple race 
tracks and also have a quite difficult race track which fish a hairpin, hairpin curve. And as a result, we show that this approach can outperform model-based system, the model-based system that has uh, developed by the company. And we also compare the performance of our approach against all the data available on this uh, race track, which consists of like uh, 50,000 of human players. And we show our approach can achieve less than then for these human players. And very interestingly, the trajectory found by our policy or learned by our policy is very quantitatively similar to the one chosen by the best human players. Okay, and um, that was about racing. And the next project is about overtaking. So the overtaking is more difficult problem because it can be considered as multi-objective optimization problem. You have kind of trade-off between maximizing the speed and also avoiding obstacles and also overtaking the opponents. And also the attention of other opponents are generally not known and you need to kind of approximate or model uh, other opponents, which can be very difficult. And the vehicle already driving at high speed and you have very limited control authority for excluding the very aggressive overtaking maneuvers. And for the learning specifically, this is sparse reward problem for realms learning because overtaking doesn't happen so often. It happens only occasionally and which means you don't have enough, enough data. So if you try to solve this problem directly using model three realms learning, it can be very challenging because of this sparse reward problem. And what we propose is to use Clickham realms learning. But the main idea of Clickham realms learning is to start from simple problem. So it's as just like human drive, like how human learn to drive is you first learn how to drive and then you learn how to overtake. And we use the same concept, like we first train a policy for the racing. And that's the first stage, stage. And in the second stage, we add opponents on the race track and we change the reward function. And instead of maximizing the progress, we also uh, maximize the progress like with respect to the, to the opponents. So we want to overtake the opponents. And in the final stage, we also add this collision avoidance uh, reward. And by doing so, we show that this clickum realms learning, simple clickum realms learning can already improve the sample efficiency compared to uh, vanilla um, reinforcement learning. For example, in this plot, you, you can see uh, the yellow line is the training curve of the standard software actor critical algorithm. It cannot solve the problem at all because the policy doesn't know how to drive in the beginning. And you try, if you try to maximize if you try to solve the overtaking type problem directly, is uh, it, it, you need much, much more data. And if you do it in a different way, like using this Clickham SAC, then first you train for racing and second stage you switch to overtaking, it can uh, solve the task, the task very efficiently. And so as a result, we show that this uh, new network policy can control the vehicle and can overtake multiple tasks at very high speed. As you can see in this video, our agent is controlled by a neural network and it, the opponents are controlled by the built-in AI. And our policy can overtake uh, all these opponents at very high speed. And we compare the performance of our agent against also experienced human drivers, we show it achieve very comparable performance against uh, an experienced human driver. So in conclusion, uh, motor field groups learning is promising for autonomous driving, uh, racing and overtaking. And by using the right electron reinforcement learning, it can be very useful for solving sparse reward problems, for example, the overtaking problem, and also can improve the sample, sample efficiency. But there are some limitations of the approach. For example, it can work only with fixed race car and track combinations to rely on privileged information like the distance measures between the car and also the border of the check and also there's still like very huge seem to real gap uh, for this policy and thank you for your attention
Thank you very much for this awesome presentation. Uh, it's still impressive to see how far we have come with machine learning uh, techniques and to yeah, replicate the driving behavior. Thank you very much for your presentation. We are moving on to presentation and paper number four from Markus Schrader from TU Graz. He's also uh, in a team that was taking part in Robo Race, now is taking part um, in the Indian Autonomous Challenge. And now we will hear something about localization techniques. Markus, it's your turn. Hi, Johannes. Thanks a lot for the organization and the possibility to contribute papers. So. Give me a second. Yeah, no worries. We can uh, see your screen and can hear you. Great. So in the next 10 minutes, I would like to talk to you what we did with a LiDAR in our first robbery season in the year 2019, the robbery season alpha. Um, but first of all, who are we? We are a racing team located in Austria, in Graz. Currently, we have 10 team members, and they are from two organizations, from Graz University of Technology and from Virtual Vehicle Research. And our team has together one, one big goal to test our algorithms at the limit. And currently, Roborace gives us the opportunity to do that. So what are you going to hear in the next 10 minutes? Uh, we used the LiDAR two years ago for two approaches. The first one was to map a whole racetrack in a short time. And the second approach was to do a LiDAR-based localization. So how did we do that? We used for the map generation and localization a LiDAR, which you can see here on the top image on the right. Uh, this is a LiDAR from Oster with 64 layers. It scans 360 degrees around and Below you can see where the sensor is mounted. It's mounted on the top of the car and delivers with a high frequency measurement. Um, first of all, I would like to show to you the final result. So you can see the race, a race track mapped from front. So the, the red dots are the point cloud, which were generated offline, and then you see the vehicle driving and the white dots are the, the live measurements from the LiDAR and the vehicle follows a white line. This is the generated optimal racing line. But of course our vehicle didn't drive that fast. So this is, I think, speed up to eight time or something like that. So what was necessary to achieve that? Uh, in the first step, what we are doing is we are creating a point cloud of the whole racetrack. So we start in the garage, we drive out with the vehicle and just record data. So we record vehicle data like velocity, accelerations, LiDAR data, map the whole track and drive backwards to the garage. And then offline, we are generating a point cloud. And therefore we are using components from outerware. We are using the NDT algorithm, normal distribution transform algorithm and Below you can see the pipeline. So we get data from the driver and then this data is then used for the NDT mapping algorithm. And then the output is you get then a whole point cloud of the area. Uh, this point cloud is then used for two things. The first thing is then for generating the track layout. So what we are doing is we are mapping the race track, or this state we we map the race track. We map the race track via our own. So what we did is we used this high, this point cut with this a lot. With, there's a lot of information inside, and we just generated the left and the right borders of the race track by hand. So we just used, I think, a lot of you know the tool Arvis in RAW. So we had just clicked with a mouse the borders. And then we had the border. So also we thought a lot how we can do this. Can we do that automated? But then we also thought, okay, there are a lot of different race tracks. There is grass, there is concrete, there's asphalt, there are walls. So it's 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 not that easy task for a simple problem. So in the end, we just click the borders by hand. And then in the next step, we generated a, a racing line. Uh, and therefore we had also two steps. The first step was to generate the reference line. So what you can see here on the right side, this is a picture from a racetrack in Hungary. 
So the black lines are the, the clicked borders by hand. And then we generate a, a reference line. Uh, one of our team members, Yasmina, she wrote a nice paper about how to create a reference line. You can have a look on that. And then we use this reference line and the borders to generate the optimal racing line. And therefore we use the tool from the guys from Munich. You can also have a look on their papers. It's, it's quite nice written and also the algorithm this works very good. And with this approach, we generated our more or less our race trick for the racing. So how does then the final product look like? Uh, the colored dots are the, the 3D point cloud in a centimeter accuracy. And then we have the left and the right border, and then we generate our racing line. And this is then used for the, for the competition. So the first part was the mapping and the second part now is the localization. So what we are getting is we are getting from the LiDAR with 20 Hertz measurements. And in the first step, we are doing a, a LiDAR distortion compensation. Yes, so you need to think when you drive quite fast with a LiDAR and the measurement takes like 50 milliseconds and you drive with 150. Doing one measurement, it will be quite of a huge distance. And also when you have curves, you have a lot of motion in your LiDAR point cloud. Therefore, you can have a look on the paper from Tobias. He wrote how we solved that issue to have a, a motion compensated point cloud. And then this point cloud is used in the next step, it's downsampled because we can't use all point clouds. This would need too much computing power. And then we have the NDT algorithm and then the NDT algorithm uses the downsampled point cloud with the before offline generated point cloud for the localization. So in the end, we get the, a position of the car and also a three dimensional orientation with the frequency of the LiDAR. And this output is then used for the low level control as an input that the vehicle knows where it is. So how does this look like? So here you can see then the localization in the 3D point cloud. What you also can see quite well is the, that the LiDAR gives a lot of information about, about the material. So you, you can see here what's asphalt, where is the wall, where are buildings. So you can use that information quite well for the map generation. And also like this thick black dots, these are then used for the final localization. So we filtered the point cloud quite a lot. And what's also quite interesting is when you do this localization and when the LiDAR has a, a huge range, you get very accurate localizations because you have a lot of points far away. So therefore you get a very precise heading and position localization. And finally, I would also like to show to you some results from, from one training because during a training, we were allowed to use GPS. And this is like um, the error from our LiDAR localization to the GPS system with a centimeter accuracy. And you can see here on the histogram. So this is like the, our localization error. And the most time it's below 20 centimeter. Um, and also, the race car has, let's say, a little bit of a limited computing platform. So we we had a very <laughs> we had a very we had a lot of issues with the CPU. So we also needed to to tune a lot on the algorithm to be able to run it on real time and to have a stable localization. But in the end, it worked quite well. And also, we figured out when we have strong steering maneuvers or high accelerations that the NDT needs much more time for the for conversion, but still in any case, we still had every time a stable localization. Um, with this approach, we achieved two good results. So on our first race, we had the second place and then on the second race, we had our first victory. And here I have a short video that you see how it looks like. So this is a recording from a training session. 
And you see like the colored dots are the live measurements from the LIDAR and the gray dots in the background, this is the 3D map of the, of the area. And also like here, it looks like that here are a lot of features, but at the end there are just some cones, some, some small walls and some surroundings far away, but still the vehicle is able to localize quite well. So this was my presentation. Thanks a lot. And afterwards, I'm of course open for questions. All right, Marco, thank you very much. And uh, now we see some real results and the struggles with real hardware uh, when it comes to bringing your algorithms to real hardware, then uh, you have to take care of that. Um, thanks again uh, for your presentation about localization. And we're moving on towards the next presentation, right, Wards, and it's from Trent Weiss, he's working with Madur together and he's now uh, telling us something about the next deep learning uh, algorithm. He wants to show us something towards multi-agent uh, autonomous racing with a deep racing framework. Right. Share my screen. So we can hear you and we can see your presentation. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Trent Weiss. I'm one of Madura's PhD students. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about you know, towards multi-agent racing with our uh, with our deep racing AI framework. Um, and, and I normally start these talks off by motivating why racing is an important problem, kind of from first principles. Um, but I mean, this is a this is a workshop on autonomous racing, so pretty much everybody is on board with that. Uh, so I'll instead just say that you know racing presents an opportunity to achieve what we call safety through agility. Uh, which is, you know, the, the ability to, you know, operate the vehicle at the limits of its control and with large control deltas between you and the other agents around you. Um, and then if we can, if we can solve that problem, kind of, you know, stepping the problem back down into more structured day-to-day -day driving, you know, as, as other, other speakers have talked about, is, is a little bit easier. Um, so towards that end, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about our, our deep racing uh, simulation framework. Um, and you know, there's there's a lot of work in in you know autonomous vehicle simulator, but you know rather than build one from the ground up, we decided to leverage the uh, you know decades of research in uh, video game environments. So we're using you know the the F1 series of you know Formula One racing video games uh, and turning them into a, a simulation environment for for autonomous racing. Um, and what's nice is this game outputs a, a, a stream of UDP packets that contain all kinds of state information about what's happening in the game. You know, what, where the other cars are, where the ego vehicle is, and, and all their, their uh, control actions. So we've wrapped this into a simulator where we can, we can both screen grab uh, the rendered images from the game, as well as capture all these UDP packets uh, and use them to, to build an end-to-end -end, uh, you know, machine learning algorithm for actually racing closed loop within you know this very photorealistic and physics realistic f1 game environment um and we've got some pretty interesting work for you know we've, we've used this to develop a model that uh that predicts bezier curves for the car to follow and achieved um you know near human performance you know within within the f1 game um but you know we want to move you know beyond just this single agent environment and then talk about multi-agent racing um so as other um other speakers have talked about, you know, racing would be a lot easier if it weren't for those pesky other cars in the way. Um, so towards that end, you know, if we want to do a multi-agent racing setup, first we need to be able to detect where the other agents are, right? If, if you're racing blind, there's basically no hope. Um, and unfortunately, the, the, the F1 game, although it outputs the geometric information about where each car is on the track, it does not tell us how those 3D points, you know, within the ego vehicle's coordinate system project onto, uh, you know, the 2D image plane of this kind of virtual camera we've set up. You know, there's there's no camera sensor being simulated, but we're taking the screen grabs, uh, you know, coming off the F1 game as kind of a virtual camera, All right? So we need to calibrate this, you know, virtual camera model, you know, the typical projective transform you see, where we need to fit, uh, you know, both the X and the Y focal lengths in the UV image plane, as well as the rotation in SO3 and the translation in R3 between the uh, the centroid of the eco vehicle, which is what the game outputs, uh, and you know, the, the optical coordinate system of this virtual camera. 
Um, so, you know, by just employing a, you know, a typical um, optimization routine on nonlinear manifolds for SO3, um, we can achieve, you know, a, a, tip, a, a projective mapping from points in the ego vehicles coordinate system onto where their pixel location is um, in the image plane. Uh, which serves two, you know, high-level contributions. One is you can now generate theoretically unlimited training data for a vehicle detector. Um, so if you want to, you know, build, you know, a YOLO or RCNN or some sort of image image detection algorithm for uh, Formula One cars, we can now do that. Uh, and and it defines sort of a detection region for um, what cars our uh, racing algorithm can feasibly see, right? We have access to all the ground truth data, but it's it's not reasonable to assume that the ego vehicle can see literally every single other agent on the track, no matter where they are. So we've got a more principled uh, method of determining what what agents are in the field of view and which ones are not. Um, so now that we have that, we can say, okay, we know where the other cars are. You know, we know which ones we can see. Um, but it's one thing to know that you know that's that's another car in front of me. It's entirely another to know you know where they're going. You know what what in you know hidden state variables you know such as velocity, heading, uh, you know, and essentially what trajectory is the car in front of you following. So we kind of view the problem as you know autonomous racing is is mostly about state estimation, um, inferring hidden state variables of the other agents. Um, from only externally observable variables, such as their position uh, and heading on the track. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about our, our initial results on a neural network based method for solving this kind of state estimation problem. Um, so our approach is to, you know, we wanna predict future trajectories, which we define as the internal state uh, of the other agent. And we do this with just, you know, a stacked LSTM layer. Um, that maps you know, a, a history window, so a context window of the measured positions and velocities of the other agents, and map that into a, a list of future waypoints that that, that agent is, is likely to follow. Um, and we use this you know, ground truth data that we get out of our you know, UDP stream from the F1 game. Uh, so the input to this neural network is just uh, a sequence of you know, measured data, which is just positions, velocities, and, and also heading. Uh, and we output a sequence of you know, future estimated waypoints uh, of, of the other agent. Um, so, you know, given our virtual camera, you know, we can we can say, you know, it, all agents within this cone that are not being occluded are, are visible by our, our uh, neural network model. And, you know, we, we train this model to, uh, based on, you know, a few, few you know, tens of thousands of, of data points off of, off of the game. Um, and we got some pretty, pretty interesting uh, qualitative results, which is just this very, very simple, you know, stacked LSTM layer. Um, it, it can can predict the overall directions of the other agents pretty well, um, but you know, these these lateral offsets are showing up in in our our projected trajectories. Um, so you know, future work would be you know you know correcting for this lateral offset bias. Uh, as well as you know, you know, reducing the dimensionality of this problem uh, by using you know a parameterized curve as the prediction for the other agents, rather than just you know suffering from the curse of dimensionality in which we have to predict lots and lots of future waypoints to you know to to parameterize the uh, you know the expected behavior of the other agents. Um, so some 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 future work would include actually doing doing this in closed loop. Uh, right now, all of our results are purely with with offline data, um, and also we want to you know apply some sort of dimensionality reduction techniques, uh, perhaps with you know Bezier curves, the same way we've done in our, our previous work. Um, additionally, we need you know to improve the neural network architecture. Right now, this is a very very simple, very thin neural network, which is nice and fast, but uh, we have lots of GPU compute available, so there's no reason why we can't expand this to a bit more more complicated neural net. Um, and finally, we want to use our, our virtual camera system to, uh, to generate these 3D detections instead of just assuming we have perfect ground truth data uh, off of all of our, uh, off of our F1 game. Uh, so thanks for your attention. Um, yeah, relatively short presentation.
Yeah, and thank you very much uh, for your presentation. I, I have to admit, I'm every time impressed to see when someone is using a standard uh, game like <laughs> F1, uh, the F1 game or previous we saw Gran Turismo and is doing such a cool research with it. So uh, congrats on that. And thank you very much for your presentation. We're moving on to our last presentation for this section only. And it's from Matthias Schmidt and Queen Long Su, and they are talking about control informed design for the IAC, the Indian Autonomous Challenge, autonomous race car for operation at the dynamic envelope. We are, thank you very much uh, for being here today and have fun with your presentation. Well, thank you, Johannes. I hope you can hear me fine. We can um, hear you and can see you. the presentation. Um, so I'm here on behalf of a larger group of Clemson and uh, um, the title is a little bit uh, long when I look at it right now, but I tell you in a second what we're actually going to talk about. So um, uh, thanks to uh, um, all the um, um, previous speakers, uh, I think we know what the IAC is at this point. Um, the Indy Autonomous Challenge, it's its first ever head-to-head -head autonomous race, and we have a lot of the competition teams here in the audience. The one thing which was not mentioned about the IAC until now was something very simple. The IAC is an algorithmic competition. It is not about uh, who builds the best autonomous car, who can set up a car in the best way, who can solve the aerodynamics, who can engineer a car. That is not what the competition is about. It's an algorithmic competition. Uh, that raises the question, if everybody, everybody focuses on the algorithmic portion, who is building the car? Um, and this is where the um, Deep Orange team at Clemson um, came in. Deep Orange is our, here at Clemson University's Department of Automotive Engineering is our flagship program in which we take um, our master students um, um, each year um, and they have to build a to design and build a concept vehicle over the time of two years. The program starts new every year, so we release a vehicle every year, and we have done that for quite some while. Uh, the IAC car is the Deep Orange 12 vehicle, and you can see some of the previous examples here on the slide. But even for us, the uh, IAC race car was uh, the fir something first of its kind. First of all, we are used to build prototype vehicles from which one car exists. So, well, if some things don't work right, that's fine. That goes home with us. But the IAC race car is a prototype for the race. So it has to be copied, you know, it has to be mass produced. Um, it is built for the competition on October 23rd. And it's one of the fastest autom uh, autonomous vehicles ever made with an estimated top speed of 180 miles per hour. Um, we didn't do this alone. Um, we had the uh, 37 stakeholders helping us with this um, project. So in this talk, I quickly give you an overview of the architecture, and this is a premiere. The car was unveiled last weekend at the pole day of the Indianapolis 500 week, and we have never uh, shared the architecture with the academic community outside of the um, IAC teams, and then we pick one particular design challenge, one particular example, and show how we used uh, um, uh, control and control design to inform our design decisions. Um, to give you a few um, specs on the car, uh, we talked about 180 miles per hour. Keep in mind, this is 80 meters per second. The car can pull a 2.8 Gs of lateral acceleration and can have a maximum yaw rate at 45 degrees. Um, the vehicle is done right now and turned out we had to do 1,980 wire connections and the total wiring is 30 football fields long. Um, when you look at the car, the chassis um, is based on the um, Dallara chassis, so just the top, but we really had to re-engineer everything from the front to the back from the mounts of the drive-by-wire system, the drive-by-wire controllers, the onboard computing platforms, to the powertrain itself, which in this car is structural. Uh, structural. And the problem there is, when we engineered the car, the competition didn't exist. The competition evolved um, while we had started that project. So we had to work closely together with the sponsors and the organizers to make sure that we enable all of the teams to do what they want to do. If Professor Lincoln decides to do stereo vision um, uh, with two of the um, six cameras uh, with his team, then we need to enable that. At the speed 
uh, which uh, that means that we have to synchronize cameras with a millisecond precision because a millisecond corresponds to eight centimeters of motion. So we had to account for all of these things while we designed the vehicle, and we even had to define the race rules and communication protocols because none of that existed at the start of the project. Um, I'm going to show you here right now an overview of the resulting architecture. Uh, it looks complicated. Um, and it is, but I'm going to work you through it. Um, you can see like a variety of different layers here. And the first thing I want to point out is this green box here. This is the autonomy computer. The autonomy computer is one computation platform by AD Link, and that's the only part the competition teams will touch. This is where they will develop their uh, perception software, their localization schemes, their secret overtaking maneuvers, you know, their, uh, uh, their streamlined strategies. And that's the only part where they can deploy software. Um, we defined a ROS to CAN interface between the autonomy computer and um, the next layer, which is the dynamics layer. And everything else on that slide is something which was designed and uh, prototyped by the um, Deep Orange team. Um, as you can see is the, uh, um, uh, some sensors such as LiDAR cameras and radars are directly connected to the autonomy computer um, because we want to minimize latencies here and make everything available at the best um, level um, possible. Um, altogether, we have a variety of computers. So we have actuation controllers, a MoTeC um, engine control unit which just shifting and controls the engine. We do have motor position controllers for braking and uh, um, a steer by wire. Um, this is a new Eagle Raptor, a rugged uh, real-time capable control platform um, uh, constitutes the dynamics layer. Uh, as I said, the autonomy computer is the AD link computer and we have a Cisco ethernet switch which also provides the time synchronization plus a variety of communication uh, devices on board. So um, I will hand over in a second to my colleague, Dr. Zhu, also from Deep Orange team, because we want to pick right now the example of how to select the perception distance of the sensors when we designed the car and how to assess the problem of latency um, in the design process. And um, because the car didn't exist, we had to uh, build that on simulation. And of course, also make, to sh make sure um, that we're trying to figure out how latencies affect um, very good state of the art of controllers. So with that, I hand over to my colleague, um, Dr. Zhu. Oops. Thank you, Matthias. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry for that. I share my screen again. Yeah. Um, all right, so to realize uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Schmidt just described, we have to decide the configuration of our computation platform and select the correct sensors from our suppliers. We need to investigate the minimum up control update frequency and perception distance to allow the teams to, to complete the in, in the autonomous challenge safely. And to achieve this goal, we are simulating a benchmark autonomous driving algorithm for a couple of, uh, of uh, different racing scenarios as you can see in the IAC. Uh, so the algorithm we investigated is shown in this slide, which is a trajectory following model predictive control and that the dynamics constraints of the systems are derived from a three degree freedom nonlinear vehicle model, which is in fact uh, reduced from uh, even higher fidelity simulation from CFD and uh, Adams vehicle dynamics models. And that the dynamic envelope of uh, this racing vehicle is imposed as the constraints, as the uh, uh, const uh, limiting uh, on the uh, slip angle of the both front and the rear axles. Next slide, please. So to find the minimum control update frequency, we investigated the overtaking scenario. And uh, this is uh, where the vehicle, the overtaking vehicle is affected by crosswind. And uh, we require that this vehicle needs to reject this disturbance within one meter of lateral deviation. Otherwise it could potentially hit the um, vehicle, a slow moving vehicle. And the simulation results shows that for uh, update frequency less than 10 hertz, the MPC is not able to find a feasible solution. And that really determines what's the minimum update frequency of the autonomy computer decision making. And that also in turn decide what are the update frequency of the lower level controllers to ensure safe, sufficient frequency separation. And uh, as for the minimum perception distance, we investigated an obstacle avoidance situation at the racing speed, which is 180 miles per hour. 
And uh, the simulation shows that for a preview distance less than 120 meters, the MPC cannot find a feasible solution without violating the dynamic envelope of the vehicle. Next slide, please. So during the hardware and loop testing of our vehicle, we found out that the actuation delay of uh, the vehicle uh, actually significantly impact the behavior of the vehicle at the high speed. So the transport delay, and uh, after we characterize our uh, transport delay and the dynamics delay of the steering system and impose that to the simulation, the plot here reveals that the previously discussed MPC uh, actually has a significant chance to hit uh, the, uh, the standing steel vehicle, or it could even generate an oscillatory or even unstable vehicle behavior because of the addition of this, uh, the, this dynamics. And uh, there's, we want to investigate the impact of these dynamics on our minimum perception distance and our control decisions. This is where we applied another methodology. Uh, next slide, please. So the methodology we used is the tube-based MPC, which is a robust optimal controller that is able to handle parametric uncertainties arrived from, uh, arised from the uh, actuation dynamics and, and, uh, and the communication delays. And the, what tube-based MPC it really consists of uh, two parts. One is a centralized MPC and that it utilizes a, a nominal vehicle model and uh, it generates a reference trajectory, uh, which you can see as a solid right line to the uh, plot on the right. And then uh, we rely on a local feedback controller and, uh, to uh, correct for these unforeseen disturbances. And, uh, and uh, the disturbances and the local feedback control, they combine together, uh, the, they formulate a tube of trajectories along, uh, around that central MPC. And uh, to ensure all the trajectories inside the tubes are, are feasible, so we have to tighten the constraints of the central MPC. And, uh, and uh, uh, that can be visualized as a magenta box around the obstacle. And that is in the, at this speed, that uh, uh, creates a safety margin of about 1.5 meters around the obstacle. And because the, the obstacle is larger, that means the MPC requires a longer perception distance to find a feasible solution. And at this speed, the increase of the distance is about 20 meters. So this is a very quick uh, uh, overview of a very technical session on our side. And with this, I, I'm, I'll turn it back to my colleague, Matthias, uh, to wrap up our presentation. Thank you. Well, uh, and this also brings us to the last slide. So thank you for your attention with a very short uh, presentation here. As everyone, every team knows, we can talk for hours about the car as they have probably witnessed in our virtual design reviews. The last thing I want to say is this entire thing was a huge team effort not just only about the Deep Orange team, but also with all of our stakeholders involved in which we work together in countless meetings and sessions and in uh, defining software interfaces, update frequencies and everything that was necessary to get that car running, which today is actually introduced to the competition teams in parallel to our workshop. Awesome. Thank you very much for the presentation. I think everyone is looking forward to uh, the Indie Autonomous Challenge. And when we see the car in action, uh, thank you very much. All right, um, so now every presentation is done for our first uh, contributed paper session. Again, thank you very much for contributing the papers today. Thank you very much for being here today. We have now 20 minutes, around 20 minutes to uh, answer some question and I would lead the discussion and I would start, uh, start right away uh, with Markus, Markus Schreiter. So there was one question about the, the Auster LiDAR. Uh, what kind of Auster LiDAR were you using? And perhaps you can give us an additional um, idea of, did you try different LiDARs? Did you get some experience with the quality of different sensors? Perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about the sensors. Yeah, so thanks for the question, quite interesting. So first of all, we didn't try out a lot of LiDARs because we also were limited and we only had this type of LiDAR. Uh, but we had different models of that LiDAR. So we had the LiDAR with 16 layers, one with 64 layers. Currently also we have one with 128. Yeah. And about the mapping. So for the mapping, we need the other LiDAR compared to the localization. Or for the localization, it doesn't need to have that much amount of layers. So for the mapping, we used 64 layers. And for the localization, we only used 16 layers. All right. Because we also tried out to map with 16 layers at 
this two years ago, but when you only have the LiDAR and 16 layers, we were not able to map, but with the 64, it worked without any other type of sensors. When you have an IMU, then you also could map with the 16 layers LiDAR. All right. Okay. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, I hope this answered the question uh, from the community. Um, then the next question is for Matthias Schmidt and, and Dr. Su. So the question is, how do you estimate the normal forces in your three degrees of freedom model it's for Dr. Tu? Okay. Um, I think I can answer this question from twofold. The first mm -hmm. one is uh, in the offline simulation, how do we impo impose the downforce into the model? And this is a really a uh, simple uh, aerodynamic equation, where, which is a one half CD, but it's co lift coefficient and things, which we calibrated from a, a computational fluid dynamics uh, simulation model. Uh, so, but for every vehicle speed, uh, in turn, that actually is tabulated and, and imposed on the simulation. So this is a, a simulation how it's done. Uh, for the uh, on one, now that we have the vehicle, the vehicle does in, has the instrumentation of a, a suspension travel sensors and suspension load sensors, so we can in fact uh, calibrate them on the actual vehicle while it's moving. I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Um, I would move one question right away um, to Matthias. Um, so we saw now you are not developing only a car, you're also developing a race car and you're developing an autonomous car. So we have like three objectives that we'd have to take care of, uh, which is quite unusual. So what do you see or what can you tell us about what is the most difficult part to bring all this together to make it a good car in the end? Oh, that's 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 a tough question. So uh, the um, uh, from from the race car side, uh, we had good advice from from actual IndyCar drivers. So mm -hmm. they helped us, you know, and we do have um, uh, good expertise here, you know, at Clemson in vehicle dynamics. Um, this is absolutely clear. I think the most challenging part for us really was enabling autonomy. Um, because the car didn't exist, you know. So how do you how do you determine requirements for something where you can't do an experiment, or can't calibrate something? Yeah. Um, we don't know how. Uh, uh, I, I'm expecting that the teams will come with ingenious come up with come with up with ingenious solutions nobody has uh, thought about before. So how do you enable these solutions before you actually know what these solutions are? Um, and I think for me, I guess this was the most um, challenging part. Um, in addition, I think uh, uh, at that scale, ensuring safety and safe uh, communication was something we uh, we took much longer time than expected for you. So all the heartbeats implemented there, how do we make sure that race control can uh, communicate to the vehicle? How do we even start from the pit lane? How do you make sure that 10 vehicles start without a human being present? Um, so these considerations, they took a lot of time um, and uh, we, we can't rely on experience of existing races because they are handled differently. They have pit crews and everything. So this was probably one of the most difficult parts, but I would say everything was an equal challenge. And uh, I will share openly with you until the car did run, I didn't believe it would run. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can totally imagine. And uh, now you're bringing up the new topic, not only fast, uh, also safe and, and secure. Thank you very much for, for your answer here. Um, we have another question from the community. Um, it's for Trent Weiss. The question is, what choices do you make to choose where to add analytic or simple equation-based methods versus the AI-based methods? Mm. Yeah, so I think you know, you know physics-based methods um, work well if you know the overall goal you're trying to accomplish is well defined. Uh, so, like in the rally racing example, um, it's it's an immensely complicated physics problem, but the universe is not going to suddenly decide to flip off Newtonian physics for no reason, right? Um, you you can you have a well-defined goal you want you want to get to. Uh, in the case of you know really close proximity multi-agent racing, on the other hand you can't control what the other cars are gonna do, right? So physics-based guarantees about their behavior go out the window. Um, another agent could decide to behave aggressively at, at the blink of an eye. And then your, your problem flips from one of making as much progress as possible into don't crash. Um, you know, may, maybe the other agent is overtaking, maybe he's avoiding a collision himself, or maybe their algorithm just made a mistake based on erroneous sensor data. 
yeah. right? So, you know, attempting to apply, you know, some sort of, um, you know, broad physics-based model of the other agents doesn't really work oftentimes in, in multi-agent racing. Um, so that's where, where AI methods can pick up the slack, right? Like if, if, you've, if you've raced lots and lots of races or you've seen these kinds of scenarios, you know, an AI-based technique is, is going to be a little bit better, I think. Mm -hmm. And now the, the additional question from my side, will we see your approach in the, in the Autonomous Challenge? Mm. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Uh, maybe not, okay. Talk to me in October. All right, okay. I'm looking forward to see it. Thank you very much for answering the question. Mm -hmm. Um, I have an additional question um, for um, Jung Long. Um, we saw that you presented in your results and the, the future future research you're doing, or you pointed out there's one big topic. It's called the sim to real gap. Um, do you have plans working exactly on this topic and bringing your model to the real car? And do you know or have some idea how to transition this gap? Yeah, thanks for the question. So, uh, for the short term, we don't really have like the the infra infrastructure to test on the real system, but there are some approaches that can be used for for solve this symptom real gap. For example, like domain randomization, and also combined with like very high fidelity simulators. And what we are working on, not instead of like autonomous car racing, but we we are facing the same problem in autonomous drone racing. And there. What we do was like we use the same approach to find the time of time of moon trajectory for the uh, drone racing, and then with this trajectory we check it with the motorbatic controller, and it can achieve near time of the moon uh, performance. So I think for the car racing it can be very similar. Like you can use this learning based approach to find the time of the moon trajectory combined with very high fidelity simulator, and this trajectory can be computed offline. And then you check this trajectory with some other best methods. All right. Thank you very much for answering this question. Um, we had one question in the chat. Um, it's pointing towards Yunki and Nan Lee. I think you can both answer um, right after another. Um, you answered the question already in the chat, but I would like to, to re-ask it here. So how did you both model the leading opponent's driving policy and what are your thoughts on interactive and defensive opponent driver models? Perhaps, Yunki, you can start and then we moving on to Nanli. Okay, thank you for asking question. Uh, we assume the, the leading vehicle would follow the same policy as the Eagle vehicles one. And uh, we, we thought uh, it could be an estimation of the best response of the leading vehicle. Okay, thank you. Nanli? Yeah, thanks for the question. In fact, in our work, we have assumed that the leading vehicle perform uh, optimal controlling. So the leading vehicle, it doesn't take into consideration ego vehicle. So technically, there is no uh, interaction considered in, in our work. But I think it's very interesting uh, topic. And I have seen a lot of works in the literature uh, for taking out taking consideration uh, uh, the game theory learning method I think it's very interesting yeah mm -hmm. thanks yeah thank you for for your answer um, we have la one last question in our Q a session I see Matthias is all already answering but perhaps um, Matthias if you would like to can you answer the question is there a GPS signal available in uh, the Clemson ESC car and what's the accuracy of the GPS I think the people would like to see if there is a possibility to localize uh, with GPS only in the car yes absolutely Janis. and the answer to mm -hmm. that is simply yes not just GPS but we have two redundant systems based, based on the Novatel power pack so two systems which contain differential RTK corrected GNSS. So IMU magnetometer fusion with RTK correction and GPS and differential signals. And both systems are uh, uh, locally on top of each other to provide redundancy. They're connected via CAN to the dynamics layer for safety protocols and via ethernet time synchronized to the autonomy computer. From our testing, um, we I think can confidentially say we are in the somewhere two to three centimeter range. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, so that's highly precise at a update rate of 100 hertz. So that's already done on the system in, their, in its best estimate. Um, uh, GPS at most can do 20 hertz, but uh, it's that reckoning in between. But all raw signals are also available in the ROS topic. So if a team wants to do their own optimal estimation algorithm, they can do that. One important thing uh, to note here is, as of now, that's for the ego vehicle, not for your opponents. Mm -hmm. So if you know where you are, you still have to do perception you know, for the others. Okay, thank you very much. Perhaps um, one last question for, for Markus, Markus Schrader. Um, so we see now here the GPS um, is doing a very good localization. So you're doing this only um, with, your, with your LiDAR map. So when it comes to the high speeds, um, we saw your results and the precision. Can you tell us perhaps a little bit more about uh, how this precision is changing when we're driving faster with the vehicle from your perspective when we're just relying only on the LiDAR? So until now, we only tried out the LiDAR up to 150 because we were not able to drive faster somewhere. Yeah. But what I personally would expect that it also would work when you drive faster. But of course, the accuracy wouldn't be that good anymore. But still, what you need is to have, so like, The LiDAR measurement you get only every 10 or 20 hertz, depends on the LiDAR. But in between, you also need to do a sensor fusion with your IMU and your odometry to estimate where you are. And this needs to be then an, as an input for your LiDAR localization, and this must be good. Yeah. So also then LiDAR localization is possible at high velocities. You only need to consider that point. All right, thank you very much. So yeah. we are... Uh... Absolutely on time. Um, if there is no question uh, from the panelists, from the community, uh, I don't see any more Q and A's here. Um, then I would like to thank you very much for being here today, for handing in your paper, for doing this awesome presentation here. And thank you very much for contributing to the autonomous racing community. <laughs> And then I would like to hand over again to Madur for our second session.